Here is our host, Tian Wei. Hello and welcome to World Insight. I'm Tian Wei in Beijing. We begin today's program in Europe. U.S. Secretary of State Mike Pompeo will travel to the U.K. and Denmark from July the 20th to the 22nd to discuss issues including economic recovery, trade, and ties with China. The Trump administration has been urging all countries to shun Chinese tech giant Huawei. Earlier, the U.K. announced a ban on Huawei's involvement in their 5G networks. Meanwhile, European countries are facing many challenges within their borders. EU leaders are negotiating an $850 billion pandemic recovery plan in Brussels. They have failed to reach a deal so far after lengthy discussions dragged into Monday, despite being scheduled to end on Saturday. The pandemic has caused over 135,000 deaths in the EU, while its economy is estimated to be shrinking by 8.3% this year. For U.S.-EU ties in Washington, D.C., we are joined by Gary Martin, senior professorial lecturer at the School of International Service from American University. Meanwhile, in Chapel Hill, we are joined by Klaus Laris, distinguished professor of history and international affairs from University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill. Gentlemen, welcome to both of you. First of all, the EU summit regarding the budget is still undecided. What are we likely to see in terms of consensus about the future of the EU? Indeed, the EU summit uh, turns out to be a very long summit. We have already had three days of summitry, and there could well be another day or two. In the end, I'm pretty optimistic that there will be a compromise, but it will be a hard-fought compromise. Essentially, there are four countries, so-called the frugal four, who are resistant to give too many grants to the southern European countries, Spain, Italy, and Portugal, who really need the money in particular mm. because of the coronavirus, and they have been hit very badly by that. But I'm optimistic that a compromise will be found because the alternative would be disunion even the collapse of the EU. I see. No one How about looking from the other side of the Atlantic, 1.8 trillion US dollars, that's supposed to be the EU budget. Meanwhile, there are a lot of positions, according to Angela Merkel, the Chancellor of Germany, among all the countries. So, uh, Professor Martin, your take. I think what we're seeing with the pandemic, or the effect of the pandemic, is it's exacerbating existing tensions in the EU that were there before. There's been a long-standing tension between North and South when it came to European economic recovery from the financial crisis in 2010. And so the demands of the frugal states mentioned by, by um, Professor Laris, they've long believed that the Southern states have not always been careful, and they're very wary of giving money for free to these European states. And to be fair, the other key dimension is that they also they have public opinion behind them supporting that line. Mm -hmm. So you have to keep in mind you have 27 you know, member states who also have to contend with public opinion here. Having said that, though, uh, we see that uh, Europe as a whole, uh, with the EU at its core, trying to struggle for some future strategies, if they could. Uh, uh, Professor Laris, what is some of the signs you have been reading uh, in regarding the future strategy of the EU. Yeah, the strategy, uh, the first strategy clearly is to overcome the coronavirus crisis. The second strategy clearly is to uh, uh, rejuvenate the European economy, to make it into a flourishing economy again. The third strategy would be to turn the EU into a more global power than it has been in the recent past. But these are all very steep uh, task and it will be very difficult to achieve them. And I think in 10 years time, that will be the same as the EU. In 10 years time, no one will remember whether we spend 400 or 500 billion euro on uh, the current effort. But what will be remembered is whether or not the EU will stick together and will not collapse, but will go on being a united, uh, 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 powerful block in world history. I think very that is interesting. what is really yeah, very interesting, Professor Lowry, you should talk about that because uh, now we see uh, the U.S. Secretary of State, Mr. Pompeo, is likely to visit the, both the U.K. and Denmark. Tell me more about whether Washington could also, as an ally, play 
uh, divide and conquer in a way uh, in uh, leading, quote unquote, uh, what the European unions are likely to do in the near future. The, 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 the discussion in Brussels doesn't seem to be happening to Washington, which is very sad, of course. That would not be the, have been the case 10 or 20 years ago. And that is really a feature of the Trump administration, which has a lack of interest in European unity. And secondly, it may even be interested in dividing up the European countries among uh, each other. And Pompeo going to the UK and to Denmark uh, is, of course, interesting in terms of foreign policy and China policy do with the discussion being played out in Brussels. You know, that uh, seems to be uh, on a very different planet what uh, Pompeo is doing. <laughs> He's more interested in containing um, uh, the fallout uh, regarding that uh, geopolitical battle between China and the United States, which is going on rather than being too concerned about the fate of the European continent. And as a European, as a German, as you say, uh, I'm of course very much concerned that the European Union may split up and may not be united again in the future. And I think that would be a loss for all of us, including the United States and China and everyone else involved in politics. I, I see uh, Professor Martin. I remember Professor Larry said the one phrase uh, that seems to be about another planet, <laughs> uh, comparing uh, Mr. Pompeo's uh, uh, agenda uh, to that is going on among the EU countries right now. Your take? I think one of the important dynamics here is the heavy-handed nature of the Pompeo approach and Pence back in February basically saying you have to make a choice on Huawei. It's either you're with us or with them. Uh, that backfired. So I think they are. the U.S. is trying to pick a slightly more subtle approach. I'm not sure it's necessarily going to be any more successful. But it's still interesting that there's been a little bit of a, an, an evolution. I mean, we had a national security advisor, Mr. O'Brien, being in Europe and trying to work and trying to work with some of the key allies in Europe. But I would agree that in many other areas, uh, the Trump administration has either been indifferent or hostile to the EU. So that has certainly made relations very challenging, to say the least. Mm. Uh, very interesting you mentioned that. Uh, we do see, in fact, a series of uh, high-level visits by uh, Professor Martin, the U.S. Uh, administration to Europe. Uh, overall, do you see a strategy coming from the Trump administration regarding Europe or the European Union? I don't know if I would agree with the words strategy might be pushing too far. I, I think see. what you've had a feature of the Trump administration is a very transactional approach. So on areas where the Trump administration in Washington believes that Europe might be of service, such as on the question of China, I think you have seen a try an attempt at courting. But on other areas where there's been difference of agreements, uh, we've seen over tariffs, for instance, we've seen over the Iran nuclear deal, there's been no problem, no hesitation to take measures that were very unpopular. Mm -hmm. So I think it's much more of a transactional and a case-by-case -case approach. But I do think, and I think it's fair to say, that the Europeans have taken in the last few years, I would say, a harder line towards China. Not as hard as the Washington line, but nonetheless, there's been some minimal convergence. Mm -hmm. But convergence at a time when there's so many disagreements on other areas. So I think that's important. As for the question of the next administration, I think it will make a significant difference depending on the outcome. What are some of the goals of the EU? Uh, whether that has been clear, particularly since the election and the new leader of the EU and the European Union coming into power, uh, and particularly with some of the elections going on in some major uh, European capitals this year or to come. Uh, Professor Laris, how much do you think these pictures are clear? EU does have or wants to have an independent path in foreign policy, including towards China. I fully agree that the EU has also become much tougher towards China uh, than they were, let's say, only five or ten years ago. At the same time, the Europeans do not just want to uh, uh, follow the Americans in their China policy. They also want to have a unique, independent role and path mm. towards China. And they need to do that, of course, because they, as you know, they are in their trade policy very much, much exposed to the Chinese market. So they have to take that into consideration. 
And traditionally, the Europeans have had good relations, constructive relations uh, with China, including and above all Chancellor uh, Merkel in Germany. So they believe they have the possibility to be a bit of a mediator, to be a, a, a power in the middle, which can really overcome that increasing escalating conflict between the two superpowers. Right. And I think it's a very, very tough uh, ambition and a very tough uh, objective, but perhaps it's not totally impossible for them to achieve it to some extent. Would the EU be able to make a decision about its future relations, for example, vis-a-vis -vis China, uh, the United States, at this point? Or is smarter for the EU and for individual capitals as well uh, to make that decision after the new administration comes into power? I think I would, I would mention a couple of factors here. I think one is, of course, uh, let's not forget also that the leadership question is also, I think, asked in the European front, because Angela Merkel has been the face of European leadership now for 15 years, but we do know that at least come a little bit more than a year from now, she will no longer be chancellor. So, yeah. so there will also be a void on the European front. One of her key goals has been to try and seek European unity on so many subjects. So I think there will also be an internal European dimension to try and figure out the answer to these key questions about the role of the EU, of the EU on the world stage and how to navigate this great power competition, great power rivalry, whatever we want, to, we want to call it. And I also think these are going to be long-term challenges and long-term decisions. I don't think it's going to be one policy decision. I think it's something that's going to be developed over the course of the next five, ten years. Yeah. So I think there's necessarily urgency, but I would add as a final point, which is important here, pay attention or keep an eye on the reaction amongst the European public. If anything, the last six months has really made the European public deeply skeptical, not only about American leadership, but about Chinese leadership as well. And so that's, I think, is a wake up call for European politicians as well about this need for greater emancipation on the world stage. Mm. But I think there are, of course, some issues which are bilateral largely between the EU and China. So not everything involves the United States. And whether there is another Trump administration or another Biden administration, for example, the investment treaty between China and the EU is relatively independent of that. That's Here, right. China and the EU have been negotiating for, uh, for the last seven years, since 2013. They still haven't reached an agreement. Now it is hoped that the agreement will come next year in 2021 and we don't know whether or not that is the case you know there are many hurdles on the way both sides want an agreement which would uh, enable the eu to trade with china in a much better way in an easier way in a less burdensome way um, and so both sides are actually highly interested in that as it would push bilateral trade and these projects will go on independent who what will happen in washington and there are other projects as well of a slightly lower level between just the EU and China, and also between China and individual European countries. So not everything is dependent on uh, the White House and the United States. They are important, but there are other things in the world as well. A few questions regarding Huawei and the science and technological development uh, going on between China and the EU, and also regarding EU's relations with the United States. Now, we have seen uh, Mr. Martin uh, the UK has made this decision. Uh, what does the uh, UK's uh, decision mean for the other capitals inside Europe? So what do you think would be a smart uh, attitude and approach the European capitals individually could have and also collectively through Brussels? There's definitely been a toughening up and, and greater amount of pressure by the United States on the question of Huawei. Is that going to have a knock-on effect on other European capitals? I'm not so sure, at least immediately. I think a lot of it will depend on what Germany chooses to do. But I would add, I think, in my estimation, I think the most important or the most useful uh, step that Europe, EU, EU member states could do is to try to come up with a collective answer or collective standard towards China and towards many other issues. I think it weakens the EU, it weakens Europe if other states can basically adopt the divide and rule. And I think it also provides greater consistency if you have a common approach to these major challenges. Mm. It's also important 
as to how the EU collectively and each individual capitals would make their decisions regarding their relations with the United States. We see that relation has been evolving already. Now, uh, with as clear a issue as Huawei, you know, it's almost like a crystallization about which decision you want to make, uh, at least for now. Uh, how do you think would be the smartest way that the European capitals would approach this question and approach its future relations uh, with the United States? Yeah, I mean, they cannot be seen as giving in to browbeating from the Trump administration. When you think of the uh, um, pipeline between Germany and Russia, North Stream, which is very critically viewed in Washington, the Germans and the Russians simply are insisting on going ahead with that. And I think something like that we will also see regarding Huawei. You know, the British, as I said on a different occasion, um, the British have essentially given in to the United States. But after Brexit, after leaving the EU, the British do not have anywhere else to go. If they also not just lose the EU, but also lose the, uh, the United States, then they are in somewhere, you know, somewhere uh, uh, in the middle of nothing, which they cannot afford to do. And uh, for the European countries, particularly strong European countries like France and Germany, this is not the case. So I can see that they will not totally give in in the Huawei question to the United States, but they will be looking for a good compromise. And perhaps I can see a compromise coming, which was on the first compromise the British entered into, that Huawei, that the, 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 uh, the percentage Huawei is allowed to have in 5G networks in Europe will be capped to 30%, 35% as it was in the British case, and that they will not be allowed to deal with the core issues, but will, you know, the parts will have to be in the periphery of these networks. They have that dilemma to be really squeezed between the two strongest powers on Earth, and both of these powers they need in order to survive in a trade way, to export, and also politically. They need to be on good terms with both of these uh, superpowers, and that is a dilemma which they will spend the next few years uh, busy to, to, to look into and to resolve somehow. But an okay. ideal solution, I think, will not exist. I think separate is the effect of the pandemic on the necessity or the pressure to control your supply chains, I think is also a factor that will probably weigh on European decisions to protect critical infrastructure. So I think that's also something that may be weighing on the minds of, of many European leaders mm. as well. Yeah. Mm. Very interesting question, both of you uh, gentlemen, uh, because uh, as you can see that uh, recently, uh, the Chinese uh, Huawei has already asked the US side to pay for the IPR the intellectual property rights that's involved in the 5G technologies, which the American companies have been using free of charge over the years. So uh, there are a lot of things, much more than just geopolitics, that's going on in terms of the interest tug of war uh, between Huawei and the United States. And many really wonder where are the European capitals and where are the European companies uh, regarding all of those complicated issues. But for now, I want to really thank both of you for joining us on this fascinating discussion. Future is not clear, but certainly with the insights from yours, we could better figure out what is likely as to be. Thank you so much, Professor uh, Garrett Martin and also Professor Klaus Laris. All the best. Thank you. Thank you. Be safe. Thank you very much. It's a pleasure.